The Unshackled Waves, episode 115. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have you company. Happy New Year. Now a couple of episodes ago we did our 2017 year in review show, so I thought it would be good to uh, start 2018 by doing a preview show to discuss some of the battles we are likely to face and how to fight back against what the left will throw at us. I thought it would be good to do this with uh, Stephen Cable from the uh, Cable Critique. He has uh, written uh, an article which discusses what we are likely to face in 2018. You remember we've had uh, Stephen as a guest on this show previously, and he also took part in our 2017 Queensland election uh, live stream. He's also a contributor at uh, Liberty Works, and he's also uh, been published in The Spectator Australia. <laughs> Stephen, welcome back to the show. Hey, Tim. Good to be with you, mate. I'm coming to you from the uh, Connor Court book room. You, you can see the, uh, some of their publications behind me right here in the heart of the Socialist Republic of West End here in uh, Brisbane. Yeah, imagine if, the, if that, that bookshop that's uh, across the road, I, I can't remember its name, imagine if, if they knew what was going on in there. Uh yeah, uh, I forget its name, but uh, yeah, yeah, they're kind of uh, very much in with the, uh, the sort of ethos of the area, I think. Now, we're looking ahead to uh, 2018 to uh, predict what's going to happen and also how we can uh, try and fight back. But we can't look at 2018 without reflecting on 2017, which uh, a lot of us on, on the right uh, believe was a big uh, setback for us. Um, now, we've done a, t a 2017 review show, but uh, we need to look at uh, why you know, the, the left was able to, uh, you know, uh, particularly in Australia, march through our institutions and set the political agenda. Yeah, absolutely. Look, I think the, the biggest reason uh, we had the setbacks as we had is because what was revealed uh, to the public at large was um, that we really had no sort of conservative representation of any note in in uh, uh, parties, you know, the Lib Nats that we sort of always uh, uh, stood as a kind of a bulwark against the insanity of the left have uh, basically been half taken over by the left and the performance of the Prime Minister in particular uh, being uh, an accommodation for the Labor Party and pretty much implementing a lot of their policies has been one of the biggest things that has taken the uh, Conservative constituency by surprise. And... Uh, yeah, there was basically no ball ball. There was no protection from the left. So when they unleashed their latest onslaught, uh, not only was there nothing to stop them, uh, they were basically helped uh, by the parties we used to trust to actually have some sort of sanity in our parliament. Uh, and uh, it's not just the, the politicians in my mind, because the, the politicians, they, they still take their cues from uh, the media and the, the cultural elite rather than the actual uh, voters. So if the, the media and you know, the academics say for you to uh, do something and you know, they have the biggest megaphone, then th that's who they're going to listen to. I certainly agree that uh, under Malcolm Turnbull's leadership, they're, they're more uh, susceptible to that. But uh, also um, during Tony Abbott's time as Prime Minister, he tended to uh, try and uh, please the uh, unpleasable, if, if I may put it that way. Way. And it's and it's basically the um, no, the the ordinary people. They're still uh, you know without a without a voice because the the media can just whip up uh, this you know frenzy saying you know look how you know look at this you know, in, injustice uh, you know why doesn't the government uh, do something about this? Yeah, oh, you're absolutely right there, Tim. Um, and they they have infiltrated their tent was sort of into so many different areas of life. And, but yeah, it does come back down to, you know, whatever they can get into law, uh, whatever they can pressure to happen. And that's where you need a strong sort of uh, political leadership that can stop that sort of thing. But you're right, there is a, definitely a cultural 
political current that's been worked on for decades and is we're seeing the fruits of that now uh, manifesting itself into all sorts of other areas of life. Uh, you know, ac- uh, the academies, the universities, the entertainment sort of and the journalistic sort of spheres of life have been working towards that sort of goal for quite a while. And now we're actually starting to see it come to fruition, not just in the fantasy world or their textbooks or their entertainment, but it's now starting to be implemented in the real world. Because even though, uh, you know, as, as they're called the silent majority, they get a vote every three or four years, that's only, you know, part of, you know, uh, what gov- government does. I mean, uh, yes, uh, you know, during election campaigns, uh, governments, you know, promise to, to do things that they think the voters want. But, you know, during the, the three, three years of government, they're, they're, they're not listening to, uh, to the people. They're, they're, they're taking their cues from, from elsewhere. And I, I think that a lot of people, if, you know, they vote in a you know, conservative uh, government, they have a false sense of security that, you know, uh, uh, I trust them to 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 do what they promised. I, I use the example again of um, you know Tony Abbott's uh, prime ministership. For example, he promised to reform uh, 18C, which uh, which didn't happen. Yeah, no, absolutely right, Tim. Yeah, absolutely right. Spot on. And so I really think that uh, it's 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 the. The people who you know are passionate about you know these uh, you know c- uh, conservative issues about uh, you know stopping the the cultural Marxist in our um, you know schools uh, and institutions. It's uh, I, I think I think that si- uh, they need to realise that simply voting is not enough. They need to ma- uh, make noise. You know, uh, let the, the the politicians know that it's them they should be scared of, not these you know leftist campaigners who, you know, ring their office and organise the protests. Definitely. And uh, that's something that uh, we have got to start doing uh, over the next few years. We've got to start working at playing that game where we are constantly putting pressure on political parties in between election times uh, to make sure, you know, they're staying in the real world. And, and uh, you know, they the only voice, make sure the voices they're hearing isn't just the voices of the left. Uh, but they're hearing our voices as well. And we've got to start making, because you can't leave it up to the other side of politics anymore, uh, because they're basically becoming one and the same sort of ideology. So we've got to start taking action in that regard, which means we've got to be constantly vigilant. We've got to be constantly active. You know, we can't just fire up an election time. We've got to make sure that we're in there the whole time. Let's look at what the left have planned for 2018, because obviously uh, in 2017 they got their prized uh, reform, uh, which was uh, same-sex marriage. Uh, but now that that's passed, they, they certainly want to move on to uh, other issues. And uh, now that they feel they've got a taste of victory, they certainly feel that they can push further. Yeah, they certainly do. Um, and... Once they've got that through Parliament, once they've got that in place, then that's it. You know, they're going to start doing what they've done in every other part of the world where this has been brought in. It'll be used as a justification for teaching the, their lifestyle in schools, their ideas in schools, and their ideologies in schools. Uh, just the other day in the Victor- in Victoria, uh, one of the groups down there, I forget the name of them, was uh, saying that teaching children about the pleasure of sex should now be part of the sex education program. And they will just keep pushing for the next thing and the next thing. As uh, Roger Scruton said, um, you never know what the next orthodoxy that you're meant to believe is going to be. So they've got their orthodoxy of today, yesterday. Uh, everyone thought that marriage is between a man and a woman. They never thought it'd be different. And then you're told by the state and by the powers that be, no, uh, marriage can be anything you want it to be. And now you have to start believing that and agreeing with that. And tomorrow there'll be another orthodoxy and they'll keep pushing and pushing until they get the type of society system that they want. And it's obviously not just issues related to uh, marriage or uh, LGBTI issues or whatever the the acronym is uh, uh, these days. Uh, Obviously, uh, one of the issues they left continue to 
uh, rage about is uh, refugees and uh, asylum seekers. So there, there's been the constant protest nearly every uh, weekend to you know bring the uh, men on Manus Island uh, uh, to Australia. And to to the government's credit, they've they've stood firm. But it's it's certainly something in the left field that. If they can, you know, be as loud and um, obstructive as, as possible, and in one of the protests, they they drove a car onto the Flemington rail, railway tracks. So they they're clearly, you know, trying to make as much noise as uh, as possible. That's that, that's something that they, uh, you know, would really like to tear down our you know strong uh, border security arrangements. Oh, absolutely! If you get a shortened government, the floodgates will be open. It's probably one of the only points of difference that still exists between the Lib Nats and the Labor Party, and that is what we do with sort of illegal arrivals. Um, and the the people that are pushing for the sort of things you've just been talking about, in their deepest theology and their deepest philosophical thinking, they don't actually believe in the nation state. They don't think we should have uh, national borders. They think it should be a free for all for anybody anywhere, which would be an absolute disaster for any country. Uh, if you don't have borders under control, you don't even have a nation. It's as simple as that. A nation is defined uh, in many aspects by its borders. So if you can have anybody coming in, if you can have free movement of people in and out whenever they feel like it, uh, you're going to start seeing massive social changes. We've already seen the beginnings of that. Uh, and many other voices around Australia are starting to raise the issues about our immigration levels in general, including Dick Smith, who's back on the scene again. Uh, bringing up this issue, and uh, it's it's very interesting. The point that you bring up is why everyone out there has got to ask themselves: Why is this so important to the left? Why do they want an open border where just about anybody can come in for almost any reason? And you've got to ask yourself: What exactly is motivating these people that they want to change our nation so fundamentally in this way? Yeah, and. Uh, another uh, pet cause of uh, the left uh, recently has been to uh, try and abolish Australia Day. And, uh, you know, we certainly hope that uh, Australia Day 20, uh, 2018 is is not the last one. And the, the Greens have arrogantly said that it's not a question of if Australia Day will change, it's when. And basically, even though Australia Day has broad support in the community, if you if you listen to the mainstream media, you'd think that, it was the most toxic day on the calendar. Yeah, exactly. A lot of what the mainstream media go on about, uh, sure, there's some people in there that sort of are lefty thinking and have their agenda, particularly on their ABC. Um, but um, half the time, they just want a story that has a bit of a controversial line on it. So it tags people in, you know, you know what they're like. Um, but again, it's a symbol of the nation state. It's a symbol of who we are. When Australia Day comes along, just like Anzac Day, we think about who we are as a nation, what we constitute as a people, where we're from, what we believe in, and where we're going. And so all the symbols of the nation state, just like all the symbols of the family, must be torn down. Uh, it is a tenet of cultural Marxism uh, that you do this. Um, and again, everybody out there listening to this, you've got to think to yourself, why are these people so obsessed uh, against Australia Day? And don't tell me it's because some Aboriginal people may be offended. That's a complete nonsense. You'll find it hard-pressed to find many people that think that way in any group in Australia. Most people in Australia love their country. They love what it stands for. And it's only these agitators uh, that are constantly carrying on and bullying, trying to bully the population into sort of agreeing with them. And, and of course, our major parties are still full steam ahead with uh, renewable energy. There has been uh, some resistance in the in, in the coalition. The, the the but the language they use is that we need the you know right uh, energy mix. That well you know where we we still believe in climate change and you know we like uh, renewable energy, but uh, we we just need a more uh, soft approach. And you know we're still committed to our you know international uh, cl uh, climate agreements and and certainly. Cl uh, Climate change is still one of the, uh, not just the sacred cows of the left, but sacred cows of politics, where uh, no, uh, hardly any politicians dare um, speak out, uh, speak out against it, and say, "Hey, this is mad." Yeah, absolutely. Um, if you wanted to destroy an industrialized economy, you would skyrocket the price of energy. 
and that's exactly what the net effect's going to be. And I've written about this quite a lot in the past, and I touched it on my latest article, that uh, when you introduce these renewable energy targets, uh, what happens there is you basically mandate that any time the uh, renewable energy is being produced, or I call it intermittent energy, is being produced, that must be given priority, must be taken, and it must be used. But it can't do it all the time, and you have to have all the backup systems. So when you have this sort of hybrid system going on, uh, you basically skyrocket the costs of renewable energy. And you've seen this in South Australia, who's like the most far down this death trap of power pricing on the planet. Uh, the prices there will make your, your hair rope. It's just a terrible. Here in Queensland, now we've got Labor Party back for another four years, if we can't do something about it, uh, they are going to introduce a zero emissions target by 2050. Now, what that's going to mean is is they're going to start implementing all their uh, renewable energy policies and we're going to start seeing the price of power skyrocket here like in other states and like they're seeing in Victoria. And I will prophesy to you now that within two years you'll see power prices double and within five years you'll probably see them triple uh, in the areas of Australia where they do this. And remember, the whole sort of electrical grid is interconnected around the country. One area is relying on another. So, you know, whatever one person does like in Victoria, it starts having an effect on all the other states as well. And uh, another thing that the left have shown they, they don't like uh, very much is free speech. Uh, we still have uh, 18C at a federal level, despite uh, uh, the coalition at least trying to uh, reform it. And in my home state of Victoria, we have the Racial and Religious Tolerance Act, uh, uh, which uh, should be known as the blasphemy law. Uh, and of course, the, 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 the left always want more restrictions on free speech, you know, under the guise of, you know, anti-discrimination laws, uh, anti-vilification laws, you know, because uh, they, say, they say, oh, we're in favour of free speech, we're, we're, we just don't want hate speech, which, what is hate speech? Yeah, it's whatever they want it to be at any given time. All those laws are just what you would call shut up laws. Okay, the idea there is uh, if you can stop people speaking, you can stop them persuading, and then the only voices that people will hear are the voices they want them to hear. The only arguments they'll hear is the arguments they want themselves, they want the people to hear. They, they, if they can stop the opposition through any means possible, and this is just simply one of the tactics. Uh, just the other day, someone for the alternative for Germany has been um, uh, charged by the police, again, with, with a hate crime for saying something that they don't want them to say. And that's the end result of this. That's, that's all they're interested in, is stopping the alternative argument. And they want you to feel like you, you don't have the right to speak, that you don't have the right to say these things. And then once you can't say things, once you can't speak, uh, you start to change your thinking as well. There's a big connection between thought and speech. Uh, which is why it's the cornerstone of all liberty. If you can stop people from speaking, you then start to start to curtail their thinking process and you start to bully them into submission. And it's part of their strategy. And that must be strongly resisted of all the things we could possibly discuss. That freedom to speak uh, must be maintained. And we certainly can't rely on anybody in power at the moment to sort of do that for us. And of course, the uh, Australian budget is still in a deficit. The uh, national debt uh, is approaching, I believe, nearly 600 billion. Uh, when the Abbott government was first elected, they said, you know, we want to address, you know, this, as they called it, budget emergency. Now the position of the Turnbull government is, you know, what, you know, budget emergency? Oh, you know, we, we will, you know, reach a surplus by 2020, 2021. But, you know, I remember when, uh, you know, Julie, Gillard said that the uh, Labor would reach a surplus by 2012-13. Uh, I'll, I'll believe it when I see it, but there just doesn't seem to be any appetite to you know, rein in spending significantly. No, there isn't. Um, I remember the hilarious words Wayne Swan said, these years of surplus I announce now when he brought in one of his budgets. Um, and that's the tactic they always use. Oh, look, we'll fix it in the future. Oh, look, yeah, yeah, okay, it's getting a bit bad now, but, you know, we're all going to fix it in tomorrow, next year, and then when next year comes along, they try and misdirect you to next year and the year after that. Uh, one of the points of difference between the Coalition and Labor used to be um, uh, responsible economic management. And even that ground they seem to have conceded in the last budget. 
Uh, maybe they decided it's not worth it anymore because as soon as we get the budget in, in repair, Labor gets in and wrecks it all again and goes spending like a drunken sailor. So, um, and it, even in the Queensland election we just recently had, we were in a massive amount of debt. It skyrocketed. It was the same under the Newman government. It's been the same under the Labor government. At the last election, they just it was it was almost an untouched subject. It's like it's, they're not even bringing it up in elections anymore. It's, it's like you could be forgiven for thinking the two parties had agreed, let's just keep spending uh, like there's no tomorrow and let's just not raise it again with the electorate. Because if both of them are doing it, the population's got nowhere else to go, at least at the moment. And of course, the the one thing the the left like doing uh, probably more than other is uh, getting offended. There's there there's always a, anything you say, even you know something quite innocuous. It, it can be interpreted as you know offensive to the you know oppressed group. Saying this is not not even directly related to you know laws against free speech as a social phenomenon that you know so, so, uh, some public figure can be you know forced into you know an apology because they you know they made some type ty- ty- uh, type of a joke or uh, you know they they wrote you know something which is factual but uh, of course even facts can be offensive exactly yeah uh, you're going to find in 2018 and beyond, it's, it's going to be an offendees market. Uh, it'll, be, it'll be wholesale offended. So if, if you don't like something, all you've got to do is claim I'm offended, uh, bring a bit of social media storm, uh, get your favourite journalist to sort of hound people down the street and say, oh, look, somebody's upset. And again, it's another method of curtailing uh, free speech. And again, offence is subjective. Uh, and the other thing you don't find is they don't go around asking what I'm offended about. I'm offended that you're wasting my money. I'm offended that you're trying to change uh, our society and you're trying to change the use of language. If you wanted to, you could all go around to everyone being offended. There's nobody on planet Earth that could not be offended. Uh, Where does it stop? Uh, And we just need to stand against that and say, look, buddy, it's time to grow up. Snowflakeism has had its day. It's come and gone. If you want to debate us, find a better tactic because uh, we're not going to listen to this anymore. Now, the Australian voters will have uh, some recourse against the politicians this year. We've got uh, state elections in South Australia, Tasmania and Victoria. Uh, probably uh, South Australia is uh, one of the, the most important ones because that is where the uh, climate change renewable energy madness is most present because they've had a Labor government there for uh, 16 years and they actually have no coal-fired power stations left. And uh, basically, the the premier there, he's he's still even though the states you know experience blackouts, has the highest power prices in the world. He's still uh, you know full st- full steam ahead. I mean, he's tried uh, he, he he's tried to have have these like oh you wouldn't even call them solutions like the 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 battery which can I believe you know power uh, a blackout for three hours. Uh, um, which, which is not, yeah. a, a lot, not a long time. Uh, he, he just seems incapable of saying, like, you know, I, we've stuffed this up. You know, we need reliable power. Yeah. 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 Uh, the election is going to be absolutely fascinating to watch. Um, you would think that with a government that, by the time the election comes, Labor would have been in power 16 years continuously in South Australia. Uh, they have absolutely destroyed the economy of South Australia. It's got one of the highest unemployment rates in the world, in Australia. And you would think, would you not, that the Liberal Party would be in a prime position to absolutely kick the living daylights out of them, rip them to shreds and storm into power. But according to the latest polling, Nick Xenophon and his party, you know, the eternal agitprop sort of uh, outsider type candidate has never actually had to govern anything at all, uh, and here he is. He apparently he's polling higher than the other major parties with this South Australia Best Party. Uh, it's an absolutely d- indictment on the Liberal Party in South Australia. Uh, they can only, they, even with all that, they're still only polling two percentage points above Labor, um, and they've got so much ammunition to throw at them. They wreck the power system. The only way they can affect the employment situation is by employing more public servants. Uh, he's done this thing with the battery you talked about. He's got these diesel generators. Uh, you, you would think it would be open slather. Uh, 
so what happens in South Australia is going to be very interesting. Uh, in some of the other polling, um, the last poll I read about uh, the minor parties, um, the Australian Conservatives were polling at about 3%. Uh, one nation that's not even registered in South Australia was polling at 6%. So they were doing better than them. Uh, obviously, they've got a bit more name recognition. They've been around a bit longer. Uh, so the end result is going to be quite fascinating. What would be most interesting to see is what would happen to Nick Xenophon if he actually had to govern anything uh, rather than just constantly being the uh, outsider champion of the people type image that he's fostered. He portrays himself as a centrist, uh, you know, not left, uh, not right, you know, just for practical um, solutions. But, uh, you know, his voting record is that in, in the Senate it is most of the time he votes for the Greens. He actually is, you know, wanting to go full steam ahead with uh, renewable energy. Like he may, you know, say he wants to tweak things uh, a bit. But, you know, why would we believe that, you know, he could, you know, do, uh, do a, a superior job of, you know, th having the you know transition to renewable energy when we know based on you know simple um, uh, you know elect electricity uh, factors that that can't happen. Yeah, yeah, exactly. He is a uh, he is a leftist wolf in centrist sheep clothing. Uh, is basically what uh, Nick Xenophon is. And uh, gee, if you think the state's in a mess under Labor, imagine if he was running it. Uh, that's where his heart lies. Where people's vote is shows you a good indicator of where uh, they really are leaning philosophically. And as you quite rightly pointed out, that is the history of Nick Xenophon. And of course, there's a state election in my home state, uh, Victoria, where uh, D uh, Daniel Andrews, he's the, the champion of the, the Safe Schools uh, program, the uh, unfiltered Ros Ward Marxist version. Uh, and he's and he's also um, you know uh, overseeing this uh, politically correct approach to uh, law and order, which has seen uh, you know uh, it's really uh, you know flared up this month the African youth gang crime wave. Where we've just seen you know violent crimes uh, th throughout the city, and their uh, you know the the police and their uh, Victorian government. Well, not Daniel Andrews himself. He's still. Off, off on holidays, but they've said that, oh, you know, we do have a problem with you know, African gang violence now. It's like, well, it took you uh, long enough. And uh, Daniel Andrews, he's always been more interested in, you know, vir virtue signalling, you know, w uh, wasting money on, you know, like community and arts uh, uh, projects. And uh, I really think that um, the polling at the moment uh, is is fifty fifty. The um, if, the, if the Victorian Liberal Party can, you know, really uh, st step up their attacks on, on Andrews, then, you know, they can, can save the state. Yeah. And, and again, I'm brought to, the, I'm brought to the, uh, the thought there that with all the ammunition the Liberal Party has, uh, you've got a government that's spent like a billion dollars to not build a road. Uh, you've got this... Uh, crime wave that apparently isn't a crime wave. Now it is. There wasn't gangs and now there are. Uh, you know, basically just lying to the public. You know there's gangs of immigrants. Everybody else knows there's gangs of immigrants. People who have been punched in the head know there's gangs of immigrants. The only people who doesn't know there's gangs of immigrants was the police spokesman. And now they had to come out and admit uh, that they're actually just lying to everybody. So you've got this situation where you, you've got the most incompetent government imaginable. The, uh, the government that implemented the state schools program. And yet, Still, the Liberal Party is only managing 50-50. Uh, you think they could tear them to shreds. Uh, but again, it, it comes back down to this point that we saw here in Queensland uh, in November last year with the election. Uh, the Liberal Party keep bringing a knife to a gunfight. And every single time, they keep getting the living daylights kicked out of them. And they've got to start fighting. And they've got to start getting really aggressive in their campaign. You can't knife your way into government. Well, they really need to harness the the anger that's uh, been building up in Victoria, because you know, they have, and and of course it's it's not just the um, uh, the uh, the youth crime wave. It's it's also that we've had three car attacks now in the in in the CBD. Um, you know, two uh, mm. two of them were were deadly, and the uh, two alleged. Um, 
uh, perpetrators were both uh, known to police and both had, uh, you know, histories of mental health, which is, you know, a failure of uh, government and the uh, and the and the justice system. So the, the the people of Victoria they are starting to, you know, cry out for for somebody to to fix this. Absolutely. Um, and they're being shown, unfortunately, that the people that want to be the alternative government aren't really showing themselves to be up to the job yet. So let's hope uh, they can get the message and start turning that around down there. Uh, I would fear so much for the state of Victoria if you get a re-elected Andrew's government. Uh, what he could do in another three or four years is sort of doesn't work. You know, it's too scary to think about. Uh, can you imagine children that are going to school now uh, having the compulsory uh, safe schools program or whatever they name it tomorrow, they'll just rejig it a little bit. Uh, but whatever they do, call it, it's going to be the same sort of theory and ideas. And so you're going to have kids going through three or four years of compulsory schooling. Remember, you have to send your kids to school uh, and they're going to be indoctrinated with these ideas and you're going to have a continual... This is, this is why it's one of the most important battlegrounds because you can get kids when they're young and teach them your theories and ideas, they'll stick with them as they get older, uh, which is kind of like what we're seeing now with this continual shift in the inner city sort of areas towards the Greens. There's generations now being brought up with this sort of leftist ideology, and they all think it's going to be a great idea. Uh, there's been surveys done recently uh, of youth, and they, they do not know. They have no idea what communism was or what it did. Uh, people of my generation, I'm 46, now I grew up in the Cold War era, we saw what communism did. We saw those people. They couldn't get away from these ideas fast enough. Some of this generation now, they've got no idea uh, what those things were like. So they're kind of like open slaver for the attacks of these other people, and they can be persuaded with sort of um, sophistry and clever arguments without actually considering what happened everywhere else in the world where this was sort of implemented. And we may have a, a federal election uh, later this year because the, the last federal election was... Uh, uh, a double dissolution election, which means that um, th uh, this uh, federal election can be held uh, anywhere from July 2018 to um, Ju uh, June 2019. And based on the polling, uh, and it's consistent, uh, we'll, we'll, it looks like we're heading for you know Prime Minister you know Bill Shorten. Even though all of the the crisis that we're facing uh, in, in Australia at the moment were caused by the, the Labor government under Rudd Gillard. I mean, they kick-started the, the energy policies, the, the, the budget deficit. Um, you know, it was, you know, their, you know, appointments to, you know, bodies such as the, the Human Rights Commission that uh, started this assault on, you know, free, uh, free speech. So it, it, se it seems bizarre to me that, you know, given all these problems, the, the polling suggests that Australians think that Labor's the answer. Yeah, look, and again, I think it comes back down to the fact they're not having the alternative argument. They're not seeing a, a sort of realistic sort of alternative. Um, when you have a weak leader that doesn't stand for it, he doesn't believe sort of they're just making themselves a small target. It's not going to work anymore. Uh, Theresa May tried this sort of thing in the UK election, and she and everybody else there was quite shocked by the amount of support that Jeremy Corbyn and the uh, sort of the revived Labour Party have over there. When he's, he's advocating uh, sort of soft or hard, even in some cases, socialism, he's advocating nationalising industries again. Um, and if, if people don't hear the alternative, they don't see sort of a credible, strong leader that can argue the case and persuade them that, hey, uh, all these unicorns and fairy floss these people are offering you isn't going to be there. Uh, they'll take your money, they'll control your life, but all the benefits you think you're going to get from it aren't going to be there. And to do that, you have to be someone who believes in something. And in the Liberal Party with Malcolm Turnbull, you have someone who believes in one thing, uh, that he should have been Prime Minister. And that's pretty much the sum total of his conviction. Yeah. So that's the sort of danger we're going to be in. If we have a shortened government, everything that we've just talked about in the state level and the things we've seen in the past, you're going to see it on steroids. We've talked about the challenges we'll face in 2018. Uh, now we should probably look at uh, how to uh, fight back because we know that the um, Australian public is concerned about the, the issues that, that we discussed, but 
Uh, we also just previously discussed how we're perplexed that, um, you know, Labor is ahead in the uh, federal polling and they're, they're a good chance to, you know, retain governments in the, in the two states where they've uh, performed worst. And it's basically, I, I feel that the, the public, they, they, they don't feel confident in, in fighting back. They feel that, you know, they, and, and this is the, the left's effect through the, the media and the institution. They're, they've made people fearful to, you know, speak out. And so they don't realise that they're, you know, not alone. And that, that's one of the things that I found uh, uh, since I've started The Unshackled is that, you know, the, um, the news and content that we've, we've published, uh, the comments are like, wow, you know, finally there's someone who, you know, uh, 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 who's, you know, speaking, uh, you know, what I'm thinking. And I realise now that, you know, I'm not alone. There really needs to be this, uh, I guess, uh, joint awakening where people, they... Because uh, they they have been beaten into submission by the left quite literally. If if the if you disagree with the left, they will try and you know beat you up. And, and I think we need we it's need to yelling. conquer the the fear that's been instilled to the people. Yeah, definitely. I think you're you're, you're spot on there, Tim, with the psychological battle there. Uh, if people don't think they can win, they won't fight. So they need to be first of all uh, make it clear to them you can win. Uh, this battle can be won. Uh, we can fight, and the ways to do it, the way to fight back, is to do what we're doing now, where you just get that message out there. You let people know, just like you said, that there's millions of other Australians out there that believe like them, that think like them, that want to see uh, the country go forward as a strong, independent sort of nation, where everyone uh, is a strong individual. They're not relying on the state. We're not state slaves. Where we have the right to speak, uh, and let people know that 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 is it works. It's worked everywhere. It's been implemented in the world and get that information to them, put them onto those sources of information that will, uh, you know, it, that will explain those things to them, explain the economic concepts, explain those freedom concepts and why they're so important. I think um, the information age is a double-edged sword in some answer. Yes, it gives the left more avenues to bully people. It gives the left more avenues to sort of push their agenda. Uh, but it's also been the age that's unlocked information and communication. Uh, in 20, 30 years ago, you and I would never have been able to do this. We'd never been able to get the alternative message out there. It's whatever the gatekeepers of information wanted people to know. Uh, that's changed. And we can get a significant message out there in a short period of time. We just have to keep doing it. Uh, it's like John Howard once said, you say it, you say it again, and then you keep saying it. And at the point where you're sick of saying it, people are just starting to get the message. So it needs to be consistent that way. So that's sort of like in the short and medium term. Uh, in the long term, there must be sort of some serious political action. Uh, the Liberal National Parties are no longer conservative. We know that. They don't have the, the back of the nation anymore. Uh, they're pretty much a duopoly with Labor. There's no real philosophical difference. So what you're going to see in the long term is more conservative parties starting and they're going to start coming to the fore. And I think the timing of that will be is as this... As I said in my last uh, piece on cable critique, uh, once the socialist dream becomes our national nightmare, we're going to start seeing the pendulum start swinging back. You've already started to see it creep in, the results of all the policies they're implementing and the real world results that's happening, like in South Australia with their power prices. Uh, our rise will be timed with the consequences of the left's agenda. And you'll start to see people motivating politically, organising politically, and having some real grassroots conservative political parties they are going to really start taking seats and start exercising some political muscle in the Australian Parliament. Uh, that's uh, a bit of a concern of mine, like that do things have to get even worse for, for people to begin to, you know, really uh, revolt? You know, for example, does, you know, um, you know, safe schools have to get, you know, even worse for there to start uh, being, you know, um, you know, uh, angry, you know, uh, parent-teacher uh, meetings. Like uh, it's, uh, you mentioned also uh, in, in your article that, you know, in Eastern Europe, uh, you know, they've, um, you know, they're really 
probably Western civilization's uh, biggest defenders. You know, they want to, you know, protect their, you know, nation, its culture and its history. But uh, they've suffered under 45 years of, of communism. And uh, I've, I've probably said this before, you know, is, is that what it's going to take here? Do we have to, you know, suffer for, for that long for, for people to begin, begin to, you know, appreciate and want to, you know, be eternally vigilant about, you know, wanting to, you know, protect, you know, Australia's uh, fr uh, freedoms and identity? Yeah, look, I don't think it has to. I think to some extent it probably will. And the reason being is because of the lack of leadership on the conservative side that we've been caught by. Uh, if you had a statesman like the statue of Menzies or Howard at the helm, could argue the case, uh, knew what he was doing to fight back and actually actually believed in some conservative principles. Uh, I believe that you know, that could be halted. We wouldn't have to go down that road. You know, you can see national persuasion happening. Uh, but given what we've just outlined and the status of political, the political situation in Australia at the moment, I think we probably are going to see that happening. Like we just said, Labor are polling federally higher than the Liberals. Uh, they may well be with him with a shot they're getting back in South Australia. If not, you'll have something else that's even worse. Uh, they may get back in Victoria. So obviously things haven't got bad enough yet for people to start realising just sort of what it's going to be. So I don't think it has to, but I, you know, in my honest opinion, I think it's probably going to, at least in the short term. Well, we're certainly doing our bit here with... Um... Um, uh, myself with the Unshackled and you with the uh, Cable Critique, we're doing our our best to you know get the message out there and make sure that the people do have a voice because you know 2018 it, it is going to be uh, a, a crucial year and um, yeah uh, it, it's fair to say that um, uh, as I said on the previous podcast that after the euphoria of uh, 2016 with Brexit and uh, Trump, there's been uh, there's been been a bit of uh, complacency, but you've got to be, you know, everly, you know, uh, vigilant about, you know, because, because the left there, they're always going to, uh, you know, try, uh, uh, try and implement their agenda as hard as possible. Like, you know, ju uh, you know, just look at what they've done, um, you know, with the, the boat people I issue, they've, um, uh, you know, we've had, you know, strong, you know, border pro border protection now for four years. Um, you know, the Australian people voted for, for it in 2013, but it's something that could be all, all wound back uh, tomorrow. So it's certainly, it's not just waking people up. It's also, you know, making sure that they uh, stay awake and alert. Oh, yeah. Look, that, 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 that's absolutely right. You, the left are always working. They're always scheming, they're always strategizing, they never sleep and they never stop and they never apologize. And that's exactly the sort of mindset we need to have. Continue working, continue being vigilant and do not apologize for our beliefs and do not apologize for our philosophies. Implement them and show people how it can work. Uh, it's exactly what you saw here in Queensland, uh, what you didn't see, sorry, in Queensland here the last election. The, they kept trying to make out the Newman government years were like the worst thing that ever happened and kept trying to make the Nichols leadership, uh, opposition uh, apologise for a little time. A lot of good stuff. They could have actually stood onto that ground. And so we need to learn a lesson about that. Stop being intimidated about what we believe. Do a thatcher on them, double down, and aim back at them. Say, no, what we're saying is actually right. You're the ones that have got it wrong, and start acting on that. Uh, also, another thing we can do, Tim, by the way, is uh, what we've got planned uh, this year. We've got a, a rolling set of meetings we're going to have. We're going to have some speakers on the conservative side of politics in conjunction with Connor Court. I'll keep you updated about that so we can keep people posted, uh, keeping people informed about what's really going on. Uh, they've got a really good one coming up about what's really happening on Manus Island. So I'll keep you posted about that and we can keep our, up our bit and keep people informed. Yeah, certainly we can uh, make uh, 2018 a, uh, a, a good year for us and uh, uh, make sure that, you know, the the advice that uh, we've given today is is heeded by as many people as possible. So thank you for joining me today, Stephen. No, it's an absolute pleasure, Tim. Great job you're doing, mate, and keep up the good work. All right, everybody, that's the show for today. Now, we've done a 2017 year in review show, and we've now done a 2018 preview. So we'll be back to our regular review show next week. 
even though the news cycle slows down this time of year, there's still been a lot happening, so there'll be plenty to discuss. A reminder that voting is open for the 2017 Unshackler Awards. There are 10 categories with 10 nominees each. Uh, so far, the Regressive of the Year and the Patriot of the Year have been posted and are available for uh, voting, so uh, make sure you uh, choose who you think is the most worthy and we announce the winners on Australia Day. Thanks once again for your company and we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.